Okay, welcome and thanks for joining us on World Insight. I'm Vito and sitting in for Tian Wei tonight. Coming up on today's program. German Chancellor Angela Merkel has announced she will run for re-election as popular sentiment continues to rise in Europe. Will Germans vote for four more years of Merkel's steady hand? Plus, Chinese box office revenues are down for the first time in half a decade. Can greater industry regulation get more people into theater? Great to have you with us. We begin today's show in Berlin, where German Chancellor Angela Merkel has recently confirmed that she will be seeking for a fourth term in office. Now, she wins next year's election. If that happens, Merkel will be set to govern Germany for an astounding. Our panelists will discuss Merkel's re-election bid and what it could mean for Europe. But before that happens, let's take a look at this background story report. Throwing down her gauntlet. Germany's center-right Chancellor Angela Merkel has announced that she will run for a fourth term in office. Being prepared to be the leader of the CDU to me always means being prepared to be chancellor. And so today, that includes being ready to run again for the post of German chancellor in the 2017 federal election. Merkel has acknowledged that next year will be the toughest campaign that she has ever run. Right-wing parties are gaining in popularity in Germany. Merkel must face off against the same tide of populism that swept U.S. President-elect Donald Trump to victory earlier this month. The climate in Germany has become harsher, but we cannot allow the right-wing populists to set the tone. Three years ago, Merkel's Christian Democrats won a landslide victory, earning 41.5 percent of the vote in the federal election. Her party eventually formed a grand coalition with Germany's center-left party, the SDP. Merkel is a popular politician at home and abroad. Things have gone down since she announced her controversial open-door immigration policy last year. It's simply a difficult situation at the moment, and I think she does well, because she doesn't take any hasty decisions, but rather reflects on things, wisdom them up, and then takes decisions in a calm way. I don't think it's very good. I think it's better in America that after two terms you have to have somebody new, not always the same person. European leaders have started to worry about the future of the EU ever since British voters decided to leave the group. Angela Merkel is widely recognized as the de facto leader of the EU, but her critics say new thinking is needed to lead Germany and Europe out of their current troubles. Now for more discussions on Merkel's announcement, we're joined in Beijing by Mr. Wang Yiwei. He's the director of the Institute of International Affairs at Renmin University. Also in Beijing, we have Mr. John Ross, senior fellow at the Chongyang Institute for Financial Studies at Renmin University in China. And also in Brussels, we have Peter Klapp. He's the head of Brussels' Office of Open Europe and Independent European Think Tank. Welcome to you all. So now, for nearly 12 years, Angela Merkel has led her country. Now she's seeking for another term. What are her prospects? Mr. Ross first. Um, I would place a considerable sum of money on her being the chancellor. I mean, the difference of Germany compared to most other European countries is the two main political parties, coalition, they've done so very regularly. That means whereas in most countries, you don't necessarily have to get 50% of the vote, but you've got to get 40 <coughs> or 45% of the vote. Mm. In Germany, she can all she really has to do is to get more votes than the SPD. And if, because whoever is the largest of the two large parties will become the Chancellor. Um, all polls indicate she'll get more than the SPD. N nobody else has a chance. The only other option would be for one of somebody like the Free Democrats for a former coalition, and they will only do it with her. So I, I would think her chance is excellent to be in the Chancellor. Wow, but she ex herself said she expects this to be a tough campaign, Professor Wang. How tough is it going to be? Well, I think uh, uh, she, of course, feels many uh, tough challenges. You know, the old politics is local, uh, even uh, maybe uh, she enjoys you know, uh, uh, so many uh, well-known uh, uh, the, globally, in the, even in China, but it's the, Amer uh, the Germans vote. And uh, because the Germans still also uh, complain for her, for her policy, uh, and the migrants, and also for other difficulties because of the uh, European Union uh, uh, challenges. Uh, after Brexit, that, uh, many countries consider about uh, she is the only, maybe the last uh, hope for the Western uh, ideology defender, and even for the European uh, integration uh, defender, and also for globalization defender. Uh, this such kind of hope, uh, the Germans 
they can take it as seriously. So it depends on, on the choice. Mr. Clapp, her chance of winning? Well, as I said, she has a good chance to become uh, chancellor again because we may see a coalition with the Social Democrats. But under the opposition, under the surface, the uh, opposition is uh, is brewing. Uh, Merkel made some very um, major policy mistakes. Uh, first of all, the uh, big energy uh, transition appears to be very expensive. Uh, then, of course, there's the whole immigration crisis. Now, those two things have been sort of stabilized uh, by now. But then, most importantly, there's been the decision to bail out um, uh, European countries du during the euro crisis. And um, after 2017, it's expected that uh, Greece will need uh, money again and that we will see repetition of the, of the euro crisis. And this will put a considerable strain on her government again. Let's take a look at the statistic. I want to read this to our viewer first and get the take from all of you. So for years, Angela Merkel's party, the Christian Democratic Union, has enjoyed strong election victories. Back in 2005, the CDU earned around a third of the general vote. In 2009, that figure dipped slightly. But in 2013, it jumped back to reach 42.5%. However, recent regional elections have Germany's strongest political party worried. Five German states held election this year, and the CDU lost support in all five states. In a surprise turn of events, Germany's new populist party, the AFD, received more votes than the CDU in Merkel's own home state. What is really behind this? The AD AFD is gaining popularity real fast, Mr. Ross. Well, it's a phenomenon that you've got in a lot of European countries. I mean, the, there is no major recovery of the European economy since 2008. Germany has actually recovered much more satisfactorily than most other countries. That's why she's doing rather well. I mean, you shouldn't forget that when you compare Germany's growth rate in the United States, really you've got to compare it at GDP per capita. But because before the refugees came, Germany's population was rather static, or, or in fact indeed was static, whereas the US population grows rather rapidly. So you have to look at that. Measured by GDP per capita, there's essentially no difference between Germany's recovery and the US recovery since 2008. But nevertheless, individual pe people feel very dissatisfied. And this, this is creating support for parties both of the extreme right and of the extreme left. But we've also got to be clear that there's a difference between a minority, even a quite large minority, who are dissatisfied and fed up, and somebody forming the government. And they're two different things. And that's why I'd be very confident Merkel will remain the government, even if some of these rather unpleasant parties um, get some support. So this perhaps is the situation she's facing now going into this election. Mm -hmm. She will probably be challenged from everywhere, from right to left, Professor Wang. Well, yes, uh, there's a, a strong phenomenon of the anti-globalization. Uh, Hopefully, right? uh, Germany's economy growing is not so strong as, as uh, Euro and also suffered from the Euro debt crisis and now so many refugee crises. And also because the Germany's uh, uh, the economy is highly dependent on the world market, its trade, uh, exports, now because of the, uh, uh, the trade you know, uh, grows less than the world economy grows. So Germany's economy also suffered. And because of, also for the uh, welfare system, the, uh, many uh, refugees and the dilute the, the living standard of the, of the people. So uh, the, for many other reasons, also uh, for the violence sometimes and the social security, and also the big troubles. So yeah. her refugee policy, will this be you know, the defining policy, defining issue of this election, Mr. Clapp? Well, exactly. Uh, that's why she has lost a lot of uh, popularity. Uh, but we should not forget that, meanwhile, uh, since um, the spring of uh, this year, the refugee crisis has been stabilized. Uh, now the German government is also making deals with northern African countries, Tunisia and Egypt, and this is likely to succeed, and this is likely to also stop the refugee flow from Libya uh, to Italy. So I would think that the real problem is more on the monetary front, repetition of the euro crisis. Also, if you look at uh, Germany's uh, national budgetary policies, uh, these have not been as sound as is sometimes uh, portrayed. Um, Germany has seen record tax income as a result of record low uh, interest rates. And still, 
it took a very long time for the German government to balance uh, the books. So also Germany's government is on an unsustainable spending pattern and giving uh, that uh, society is aging in Germany, this um, is something that will become a problem in the future and Merkel has done almost nothing uh, to prepare for that. So do you think she will change her chance, Mr. Klapp? Well, uh, I don't think so. Uh, she, has, she, uh, she has changed her policy over, um, over refugees. She's not likely to change her policy over, um, over uh, the uh, euro crisis. Um, now, I think at some point when there's a financial crash or some other big financial event, Germany will be tested again. And uh, the question will be, are you willing to again um, put up a lot of savings to keep the monetary union in Europe together? Or do you think that this time it is too much? Now, I suspect that if it is too much uh, and if that would happen during Merkel's term, which is not, um, not, uh, which is hard to say because it can take another 10 years now, but uh, I think then uh, also Merkel would, uh, would be forced uh, to step down. Now, a panel here in Beijing, would you expect any drastic change in terms of policy uh, from Merkel because the situation is so different with that before the last election? I mean, back then, her popularity was high. So was her party. They were getting more than 42 percent, but now their rating has dropped to 32 percent according to some of the polls. Mr. Ross, were you worried at all? No, not particularly. Um, again, you know, I think people get rather alarmist and they tend to exaggerate things, right? Um, will the alternative for Germany get a higher vote? Will we have shock headlines? Yes, I suspect so. We will have you know, some unpleasant people with unpleasant views will get a surprise in the high vote, right? But will that rock the stability of Germany? No, because Germany is astonishingly successful. Not merely does it have uh, say per capita GDP growth that's almost as low, great as that of the United States, but it has a huge balance of uh, payment surplus. The savings level in Germany, if you take into account the external accumulation, is absolutely enormous, one of the, one of the highest in the world. So therefore Germany has some, um, still some room for manoeuvre, and Germany should un uh, does understand, I think Merkel understands, that she can't continue to have the euro and make no transfer payments from Germany to other countries. I would prefer that these were done in a rather organ more organised way, through some sort of European budget, but if they have to, these transfer payments have to be made through chaotic crises and deals, then the transfer payments will be made, and I'm sure she understands that. Professor Wang? Germany, uh, I think uh, it's uh, still next four, uh, nearly one year ahead, so it's uh, so too soon to tell, uh, because it's, uh, so many elections, even before uh, the, the, the German election. No, next uh, December 4th, there's a referendum in Italy <coughs> and also uh, in Hungary. And then next uh, May, uh, next March, the uh, Netherlands also have the election. And the next May in France, mm -hmm. whether the right wing, uh, the Le Pen will take power. So, so many uh, uh, political elections that will also impact uh, the Germans' choice. Mm -hmm. Because the Germans' market is highly dependent on the Euro Eurozone. Mm -hmm. Before the democracy, 75% of the uh, exports goes to uh, the Eurozone market. So all these elections, I think, uh, including the Brexit, where they uh, start as, you, uh, as uh, expectation, so to also impact uh, the German economy growth and also the relations between Germany and uh, uh, the European Union. But experts really portray a very different picture from what Mr. Ross has just said. They say that 2017 will be a year of uncertainty. It will be a big year for Europe, given that Brexit negotiation will officially start negotiation and France will have a new president. And then Trump adds more certainty to the U.S. and European alliance. Um, so with all this uncertainty floating in the air, many really look to Merkel as a source of stability. Uh, what would you say to that kind of comments? I, I think she's a very calm player. I think she's extremely impressive. Um, there's a saying, you know, cut your cloth nine times, uh, measure your cloth nine times before you cut it. And she yeah. seems to follow that. Uh, will there be problems? Yes, doubtless there'll be problems. Uh, will there be uncertainty? Will there be sensational newspaper headlines? Will people carry out negotiations until four o'clock in the morning? Uh, yeah, I'm absolutely sure they will. But will the euro fall apart? No. Will Merkel cease to be Chancellor of Germany? No. Uh, will there be a deep recession in Europe? No. So we will, we will have some problems. That's why we have to have governments, because they've got to take right decisions. And 
Angela Merkel is one of the toughest people around in Europe. She's very experienced it, and she's one of the hands to deal with it. So she will have a lot of problems, and she'll basically succeed in overcoming them. That would be my perspective. Mr. Clapp, what do German people think of Merkel? Do they see her as a pillar of stability, as many have said? Do they see her as the unifying figure, as we're seeing a more polarized society now? Well, her popularity rating has fallen, but it's still uh, quite high, so I wouldn't write her off uh, just yet. But um, as I explained, some of her policies, especially the bailouts or the transfers to other European countries, are unsustainable. Uh, not only are they unpopular in Northern Europe, including in Germany, but also the fact that, uh, of course, conditions are linked to it, are very unpopular in Southern Europe. And uh, by implementing these policies, Merkel has um, contributed to the popularity of Eurosceptic populist movements in Southern Europe thinking about the communist Syriza in Greece, uh, about the, uh, the left-wing populist uh, Five Star Movement in Italy that may become uh, the biggest party of Italy in the next uh, election. So this is all uh, boding not uh, very well. Uh, now, uh, don't get me wrong, I don't think that uh, if the euro would ultimately break up, uh, that this would necessarily be um, uh, a bad thing for Europe. Uh, I think it would be very painful on the short term, but ultimately it would reduce the capacity to issue more debt in uh, Europe um, and uh, this would on the long term be a good thing because one of the reasons why um, the economy is, is actually uh, struggling in many places also in the United States but also in Britain, in, uh, in Japan is because there's too much debt so uh, to lose the euro as that gigantic debt machine would on the long term be beneficial uh, for the European continent. Let's also look at her stumbling blocks. Uh, what, who will emerge to be her biggest competitor, uh, Professor Wong? Well, there's a, a saying that, if, uh, that uh, the Ministry of Finance uh, is a, a competitor for that for a long time. Uh, so it depends on the party, uh, I think. But one thing I cannot uh, agree with the, the, my European uh, pan, uh, panelists that uh, that uh, Euro uh, collapse is uh, is not so dangerous. I think Euro uh, is not just for uh, uh, consideration of the finance as a capital. Uh, it's also uh, a symbol of the unification and uh, uh, integration, and also it's a, a guarantee of the European uh, peace. Uh, if the euro collapse, uh, I think uh, no one trusts uh, the European Union of the future. So it's very dangerous. So I think uh, the Germany are uh, very definitely uh, uh, like a strong leader to uh, a tough negotiation history with the Brexit, the another lady of, the, of your uh, Prime Minister. And so uh, I hope uh, Angela Merkel will still lead uh, Germany uh, and then and, uh, take the European integration uh, moving ahead. Her, her opponents, Mr. Ross? Well, the formal opponent would be the SPD, but there's no poll that indicates that the SPD will beat her. On, on the question of Europe, I, I wrote a paper in 1996, that's 20 years, 20, 20 years ago, called The Economic Consequences of a Single European Currency, which explained why the introduction of the Euro and the way it was done would lead to a crisis. You, you have to have transfer payments. Germany derives enormous advantage from the Euro because you can't have competitive devaluations against it. Against, against Germany. These enorm it can't take 100% of these big advantages and give 0% back. The most rational way to be would be like in the United States where rich states you know, like New York or California subsidize poorer ones. That would mean a stronger European budget. If you don't do that, you won't stop the transfer payments taking place. They will just take place in a chaotic fashion with debt cancellations and conditions and so on and so forth, which is undesirable. But in the end, the transfer payments will be made and Germany won't get rid of the euro because the euro brings such advantage. It had devaluations against Germany. The German big industry doesn't want it and it can decide that it won't happen. Mr. Klab, I saw you kind of shaking your head over there. Your response to what's just been said? Well, two things. Uh, first of all, um, the euro is, is not a peace project. Uh, the euro has brought conflict to Europe. Uh, Germans were the most uh, popular tourists in Greece before the euro crisis erupted, or a lot less popular. There has been uh, a lot of tensions between the two countries 
um, unfortunately, as a result of uh, forcing both countries in this uh, single monetary uh, straitjacket. Uh, secondly, um, only German exporters and then specifically weak exporters are uh, profiting from the artificially uh, undervalued um, German currency. Um, this is actually not a good thing for importers, for consumers in Germany, for savers, really uh, being savaged in, uh, in Europe uh, at the moment. So economically this is not a good thing. Also um, to compensate uh, the Euro's flaws with transfer payments, I know many economists think that's the right thing. Well, they have tried this in Europe. Since 2010 we've seen a lot of transfer payments and the Euro crisis um, is still there, it's still a very shaky system. Um, Portugal um, uh, a month ago uh, almost lost access uh, to the ECB, uh, propping up the country um, as a result of a, um, a, um, a rating agency that almost uh, pulled the plug out of the country. So the situation is very, uh, very fragile and transfers have not stabilized it. I must say, to be fair to uh, Merkel and her finance minister, in 2015 they did seriously consider another approach which was to um, um, to take Greece out of the monetary union in a prudent way. It would have been possible then because the banks were closed in Greece anyway, but they didn't dare to do it uh, because they were um, probably rightly afraid of the uh, contagion effect. So I agree that uh, blowing up the euro would be very painful on the short term, but on the long term we would probably see better relations between European countries, so more uh, peace and also economically it would not be possible to uh, go so deeply into debt. Um, uh, governments would have to be smaller, leaner um, and uh, the economy would, uh, would flourish as a result. All right, that's all the time we've got for this segment. Many thanks, Mr. Clapp, joining us there from Brussels and my panel in Beijing, Mr. Ross and Professor Wang. Many thanks. Now you're watching World Insight. Uh, we're going to take a short break. Still to come on the program. Now China is set to overtake the U.S. as the world's biggest film market within the next three years. But will fake box office results and unfair competition hurt the industry? Stay with us. Welcome back. Now we turn our focus to the Chinese film industry. Analysts expect China to overtake the U.S. as the world's biggest movie market within the next three years. But after years of surging growth, China's box office has experienced a sudden slump. Our panelists will discuss the recent downturn and what it means for China's film industry. But first, this background story. High expectations. Chinese movie ticket sales were up 79 percent at the start of the year. But then an unanticipated lack of demand shrunk box office revenues by nearly 13 percent. Consumers say there are a number of reasons for the slump. Ticket prices are going up. A few years ago, I could get a big sale promotion online, but now there are many. I don't really expect much from the domestic movies. I prefer foreign blockbusters, but I don't see many here in the cinema, so I sometimes watch them online. Analysts say false box office reports have hurt the industry's reputation, while others blame the industry for churning out too many low-quality films. Last year, China saw more than 8,000 new screens being set up. That's almost like a new one every hour. So the production teams felt that they needed to bring on more new films as well. But with more and more movies released at the same time, each one will have a smaller audience. It only takes three days to decide whether a film gets and after another week, you see another batch of new movies being released. Every Friday, we could have seven or eight new movies. A quota on the number of foreign films allowed in Chinese movie theaters could also be hurting sales. Hollywood has been working hard to cater to China's ever-expanding passion for cinema. American studios have cast an increasing number of Chinese stars in their films. They've also set up cooperation projects with Chinese counterparts. But box office revenue is still slumping. Many insiders calling for the industry to focus more on creating quality Chinese films. 
Now, for more on the movie industry in China, in Beijing, we have Mr. Ben Jin, producer and former executive at Warner Brothers and Disney. Also in Beijing, we have Rick Dannen. He's the co-director at the Global Business Journalism Program at Tsinghua University. Welcome to you both. Thank you. And all right. That's all we have here. All right. So last year we saw really a phenomenal growth in the Chinese industry. I think the industry grew at a percentage of 49 percent to be exact, yes. right? Yes. But things kind of cooled down a bit for this mm -hmm. year.、Yeah. What's behind this big slump, Ben? Well,、um, well, on the surface,、uh, there's you know、uh, there's a decrease of what we call piao pu, the subsidy on the ticket price.、Mm -hmm. That's one of the reasons. But in the bottom, I think、uh, the lack of quality films is. Personally, think it's a key reason for the, you know, slowdown of the growth of the box office. What do you think? I mean,、happened? I agree. I, I think that the biggest reason is that there have not been new good quality films, both made in China and the Hollywood、uh, blockbusters.、Right. Also, fifty percent increase in a year is unsustainable.、Yeah. If you take this year and last year together, ten percent growth this year. Although there's been a big slump since the summer.、Uh, And you add it to last year; it's still a 30 percent increase. So it's still it's still very large. But we have to say that the trends are troubling. I mean, you 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 don't want to have it dip at all. And the question is, what can Chinese filmmakers do、uh, to bounce back to to produce movies that people will want to see in China、mm -hmm. or elsewhere、Great. in the world? I mean, Ben, you were producing movies、yeah. in the North America market.、Uh -huh. When you look at the market in China、yeah. and compare it with where、uh -huh. you're from,、uh -huh. what do you see China is lacking? Well,、uh, I think. Well, there are a lot of you know. There's a great number of you know uh, uh, movies produced every year. Is I think for the past five years, it's like on average six hundred, seven hundred movies produced every year. So the number is big enough. But I think there you know we lack a kind of diversification. Different genre movies or movies that can satisfy the needs of different you know、uh, audience. It's more like there's so many. Uh, you know, especially this year, romantic comedies or fantasy movies. But there's a lack of diversifications.、Yeah. Do you think the slump in Chinese box, sale,、uh, box office sales has gotten them worried? The Hollywood studio. You mean Hollywood studio? Yeah. Are they worried about, about this? I think so because traditionally,、uh, pretty much all the superhero movies, Hollywood blockbuster movies, can deliver, perform very well, great box office. But starting from end, of, I think the end of last year or this year, even the Hollywood box office doesn't work anymore. You know, I think. Why is that? Why do you well, think that? Chinese. I think we have seen、uh, for the past years all this kind of. Superhero special effect, all this fancy stuff. I think people are fed up with kind of things. People need good story, good acting, good you know, really really touching you know,、uh, stories. And many of the Chinese audience here, they did not grow up with the sequels of this franchise,、mm -hmm. right, Mr. Donna? Well, in, in fact, it's true, and I, I say that's also true in the United States. Are we coming to the end of the superhero franchise era? Uh, I, I guess you could say it started、mm -hmm. the modern era with Star Wars back in in 1976, and Star Wars may herald the end of it. It may be the last great franchise、uh, movie from last last year.、Mm -hmm. But、uh, I, I think that Hollywood has bet on China and is at risk in two ways. One is that they have. Uh, they expect the box office to be so large that they're building it into the cost of their movies that they're going to get big box office in China.、Mm -hmm. So they need it. The second is they're now partnering with with Chinese companies and they're making a bet on China. So they need it. They need China to be successful.、Right. And so it's it's really as much of a gamble in Hollywood now as for some of the Chinese movie makers because they they have raised the stakes with their investments、yeah. the last few、yeah. years.、And、that's why they're not all this. Uh, Hollywood companies are sending all these、yeah. big Hollywood stars to China to promote their movies. Yeah, yeah. So if you were to make another movie, what、uh -huh. genre, what genre would you pick? Well, what would you、um, say would be the next hit? If the movie is more for、uh, for, for, the, for the Chinese audience, I would do drama. I would do you know movies based on the local stories, local bestsellers. But if we would like to do a real international、uh, movies that can appeal to audience worldwide, I would like. Choose 
fantasy uh, science fiction movies. Actually, mm -hmm. we are doing a science fiction fantasy movie called Make, based on the uh, American bestseller you know, novels. Uh, we're cooperating with Warner Brothers. We're doing the shooting in New Zealand and Hainan Island right now. Yeah. Do you think the Chinese movie has what it takes to take on Hollywood blockbusters? Uh, I think so. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. Yes. You agree? I mean, I think the biggest challenges facing China are uh, in scripts more than anything else. Storytelling is is just not quite up to the level of of uh, Hollywood or some of the European scripts. Uh, some some of it is also characters, compelling characters, and what makes successful movies in America is that America is so diverse that you you can't have a have a movie that's targeted to a tiny little audience, and so it tends to be, go well internationally. <coughs> China needs to think like that, and I think stories about characters, about com some of my favorite Chinese movies mm -hmm. are movies about really interesting people and tells their story and you have great acting. I think sometimes some of the most famous actors in China, like in the United States, mm -hmm. are not the best actors. Mm -hmm. And and also some of the ones who, who are uh, the most famous don't see that a movie is going to be a success. Mm -hmm. They don't bring box office draw. They're not a guaranteed success mm -hmm. in China. And so you need not only a star, but you need a vehicle that people will want to go see. I, I think that's a challenge in telling in telling better stories and sort of pushing mm -hmm. uh, put, pushing the, uh, the the traditional uh, limits of the storytelling in China. So how does it work? How can we inspire good stories, good storytelling in Chinese movie well, industry? Well, we need to inspire or encourage the writers, right? Of course, better pay, and give them enough time to write, because. You know, because of the all all this crazy growth in China's you know uh, film industry, you know uh, uh, many you know uh, very often we don't have uh, in we, we we don't give enough time we don't give writing enough time to mm -hmm. do the research to do the first draft second draft the final draft it really uh, really push you know push them to finish the whole thing the story in a very short time. But which this, how how does the normal cycle work? How long does it take? Well, how long? You know, it could take like two years, three years, even ten years for very, you know, good, good material. And how do but you see it work here normally, I think China? here, uh, well, sometimes it's like six months, especially well, what they call the IP-based yeah. oh, right. movies. So, yeah, those what, are what huge what happened, hits. What happened this year was the movie studio saw the 50% increase last year, and they rushed things into production because they wanted mm -hmm. to cash in right away exactly. and some of them were made too quickly yeah. and, and, and you could tell in the script and you could tell in the direction and in the editing and that was a mistake. They, sh they, they, sh they, 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 sh they should have waited to make better movies, to yeah. make the same movies better. Yeah. Yeah. And just what more can be done to you know, increase the box office sales, do you think? Um, well, better uh, of course, better products, better movies is the key thing to push the whole box office. And uh, I well, think we'll talk about the writers. What about the actors and actresses? You know, the phenomenon you're seeing well, here in China because some of them have really mediocre acting skills, exactly. but they are, you know, they they have base. Well, I would yeah. say getting better vehicles to the best actors and actresses. There are some great mm -hmm. actors and actresses in China. They're just not the ones with the biggest fan bases. You're yes. absolutely right. Yes. Yeah. Another thing I think is they, that they have to appeal to the demographics of China, that there are not enough movies that are made, quality movies that appeal um, to women. And I think that that's a big growth area for, for yeah. Chinese filmmaking, yeah. Yeah. potential growth area. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it's been proved that a number of Chinese firms have been you know, caught pumping up ticket sales uh -huh. to generate market buzz. Yes. Um, so a new law has been introduced to penalize the yes. distributors and theaters who do yes. that. Do you think that it will help? Uh, it will help in you know in a way, but when we talk about Fox, uh, Fox box office reports, yeah. there are actually two sides of the coins. Mm -hmm. uh, on one hand, uh, there are some companies you know in order to to make really you know marketing buzz, they pump up the box office by buying tickets themselves. But on the other side. There's also what we call the stolen or missing box office, meaning that some of the theaters they don't report the real box office. They hire some, you know, ticket sales, put the money to themselves. So essentially, there's a neutralization effect. Mm -hmm. So I don't, I don't, I don't think the Fox box box office is is the reason for the slowdown of the. You know, but to me, market. transparency is always good. I mean, yeah. if if we get something that's closer to reality. 
that reflects what's really happening, that has less corruption, it's a good thing for everybody. Right. Yeah. And China also limits the number of foreign films yes. that can be shown in the country. Uh -huh. uh, there's a quota, only 34 foreign films are released in China mm -hmm. each year, and there's also a blackout period for which, you know, only domestic movies, <laughs> in order to just promote domestic yeah. movies. Yeah. Um, so how is this really affecting the I like the, the word you use, blackout, because it's kind of taboo, you know. We're <laughs> normally we don't, we don't, we dare not use this word blackout period for uh, Hollywood movies, I mean foreign movies. But actually there are in total 64 quota for foreign movies to be released in China. And of course some of the quota will be saved for uh, non-Hollywood movies, but majority of the movies, uh, foreign movies are Hollywood movies. Well actually I never see uh, when I work with Disney, I worked with Warner Brothers before, I never see uh, I don't, I, I, don't, I don't believe the priority for Hollywood studios is to increase the quota. No, that's, you know, 64 movies is good enough. You know, it's, it, it's like on average five or six foreign movies per month for Chinese audience. It's, it's, it's good enough. The thing is, the Hollywood studios, they would like to have better treatment when they promote and distribute the movies. Like you said, they don't want blackout period. They want the movies to be opening in the holiday holiday season, the best, you know, distribution corridor. So that's the key for their for their goal to to expand their business in China. Your thoughts on this quota system, do you think it's absolutely necessary? Um, I don't think it's necessary. I understand the sense of protectionism of of allowing the, the local homegrown market to incubate and to give some sort of, of competitive advantage. I mean, I think the bad side out of, for Hollywood is not that they limit the number of blockbusters. It's because there's a quota. They choose the big, the big action commercial movies, movie. exactly. the commercial mm -hmm. movies. Right. And what's missing from China is people don't get to see some of the great small movies, yeah. some of the award-winning movies, because they're not big box office. Mm -hmm. And so some of the best actors in America and in Britain are not known in China because their movies are not shown here because they don't make big action movies. And, and it's also because the Chinese audiences are not exposed to some of this really good storytelling. So I think, I think some Chinese movies might be better if you had some of these smaller really high quality mm -hmm. movies mm -hmm. come in from, mm -hmm. from abroad. Yeah, I agree with you, Rick. The, I think the, uh, the issue of the, the quota system, or, or in other words, the increase of the quota is not about bringing more Hollywood superhero blockbusters. Right. It's about bringing more like quality art house movies, mm -hmm. you know, other kind of movies. Yeah, that's the key thing. There are two important players here in, in the China, Chinese uh, movie industry, the Wanda Group and the Huayi Brothers. Mm -hmm. um, so they are competitors. So Wanda has mm -hmm. reportedly been shown showing fewer Huayi films, uh -huh. especially after the former Wanda executive became Huayi CEO. Yes. Do you think the competition, what do you think the competition this between This is companies? a very touchy subject, because on the way here, I saw on WeChat a statement from Huayi Brothers lawyers accusing some of the people spreading rumors that they mani manipulate the, uh, the, the showtime, the box office, everything. So it's very sensitive. Is that I'll true, be very though? careful. I'll be very careful when we talk about this. But the thing is, you know, in China, we don't have this, what we call the uh, uh, Paramount case, Par Paramount antitrust case, meaning that we don't have the antitrust law in China. So as a business, they have, you know, Huawei Brothers and both Huawei and Wanda, they're all vertically integrated uh, uh, film groups. They produce, they distribute, and they own theaters. They have the right mm -hmm. to give favorable treatment to the, to the movies they produce, right? Mm -hmm. and, 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 and give their competitors bad time, bad you know, show time. That's mm -hmm. their right. So I think the key thing is we should lobby into the government to have this antitrust law as soon as possible. Should we get the government involved? Well, the government is the only way you could you could stop this. I mean, it, it does remind me of the good old days or the bad old days of yeah. Hollywood wars between the moguls, the big Hollywood producers who hated each other, and they did whatever they could because they had what in business is called the vertical integration. They controlled everything from the studio to the theaters. Uh, right. and, and again, there is not the antitrust in China, so unless the government acts, it will continue. It's an interesting story for us to cover, mm -hmm. uh, but it, it'll be in conflict. Yeah, this fight is a good thing. I think the government will consider it a serious you know, situation and may step up. 
are. To, you know, to, to, to make a law, you know. I want to also read to you this and our mm -hmm. viewers and get your response to this. Sure. So word of mouth has played a crucial role in China's recent yes. box office yes. boom. Personal recommendations can create what analysts call the invent movie phenomenon. Mm -hmm. According to one survey, about 30% of Chinese between the age of 13 and 59 who lives in major cities go to see a movie at least once a year. Meantime, around of 76% of Americans in the same age bracket go to the cinema every year. I see you guys nodding your heads earlier so about this word of mouth culture. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, it is very important, especially uh, because China uh, you know, the moviegoers, they rely uh, a lot of information on the, uh, I mean, they, they, they get inv their uh, information from the social media. Social mm -hmm. media is so popular in China. Mm -hmm. And the word of mouth can spread like overnight. Mm -hmm. And the movie business is what we call the overnight business. Mm -hmm. So when the m word of mouth, you know, come out, it's, it, it will, you know, push or kill your, your, your movie. But you, so. when you look at the comparison between China and America, do you see a lack of modern movie going culture in China? It's different. I think that there is not a culture of criticism. It's one reason the word of mouth is the way it spreads, because there, 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 are, there are not the same, the same kind of, mm -hmm. of way. But in the U.S., the, the, the word of mouth is also hurting some of these new franchise supposed blockbusters because people don't like the movies. Mm -hmm. And they're spread. That's one of the reasons Hollywood is struggling with some of the flops of the big franchi mm -hmm. franchises, mm -hmm. Batman, Superman, mm -hmm. because right. people just didn't like the movie and they spread the word to their right. friends. We've got to go. Yeah. Pleasure to talk to you both, yeah, Ben and too. Mr. Donovan. Thank, Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you. So that's all we have for today. If you'd like to see more, you can visit our website. Just type World Insight CCTV News into your search engine or check out our YouTube channel as well. From me, Li Tuan, and everyone on the World Insight team, thanks for watching. And tune in again next time for more insights from across China and around.